Lopez wants it away. And it's a deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Home run. Mike Piazza and the Mets lead. Three to two. Bartolo has done it. The impossible has happened. This is one of the great moments in the history of baseball. Ladies and gentlemen, Mets fans of all ages, here is your host, Nick. Hello, Mets fans. Welcome back to another edition of Believe in the Mets. I'm your host, Nick Durst, and we are close. We're getting close to opening day now. The roster, it is shaking down to its final formation, its ultimate form. I know a lot of Mets fans are excited. Of course, you guys know I'm not one of them. I have uh, low expectations for this year. I'll dive into that a little bit more as to why that is the case for me this year as far as what I'm thinking with the Mets. But this is Believe in the Mets. Make sure you are subscribed to us on all social media channels and on YouTube, of course, at B-L-E-A-V-I-N-T-H-E-M-E-T-S. And joining me here today, he has his own channel as well. So we're going to do a little collab here as we approach the season here. Welcome into the show, Mr. CP, here he is. CP joining us right now. Welcome in, man. And the roster right now, it is it's shaking out. And uh when I'm looking at things, the, the pitching staff, starters and bullpen really worry me. Um, I want to get into the starting rotation in a minute here, but let's talk about the bullpen first. Obviously, having Edwin Diaz back is great, but how often is he gonna be able to get the lead? I mean, these, these pitchers are hard to watch. Fujinami, this guy, CP, he cannot be on the opening day roster. He has a 12 ERA in spring training. He does, has major command issues. So the guys like him and, and Tonkin, you know, I'm worried about them. What, how are you feeling about the bullpen for the Mets? I'm actually feeling pretty good. Um, I think I'll take an opposite stance to that. I think that the bullpen might be the strongest suit of the New York Mets this season, to be honest with you. I think you have your core five or six already in the front end of that bullpen, or the back end, I should say. And you're just trying to plug and play with who's going to be in the front end. Now, to your point, Shintaro Fujinami definitely is not going to be on the open day roster, right? We saw it even today. I went live, talked about the performance, a couple wild pitches. His command just simply hasn't been there on and off. We know the type of stuff that he possesses, but he's definitely a work in progress in terms of being a project for the New York Mets to figure out. Um, so he has three options left available. He'll be starting in AAA Syracuse, and we won't know when he'll be coming up, obviously, to the, to the regular team in Queens. But uh, Michael Tonka, another name that is definitely competing for one of those last bullpen spots. If I had to guess, there's probably one bullpen spot up for grabs. You're talking about your Sean Reed Foley's, your Michael Tonkins. Austin Adams had a little bit of a rocky outing a couple days ago, but he's been impressive through and through nonetheless, I would say, posting a scoreless inning today. Michael Tonkin hasn't allowed an earned run in spring training so far. Um, he's got a nice little sweeper. Really good movement on it, and I know that he's sort of a journeyman, picked up from the Braves last season, was one of the David Stern's finds. Um, but I think that really the Mets' least of their worries is the bullpen. I'm a little bit more concerned about that starting rotation and how the back end of that lineup, like you said, getting the runs to set up an Edwin Diaz for a save, how that's going to shake out. Yeah, like I want to see Phil Bickford make the bullpen. For me, I'm just a little confused. You know, they're, they're bringing all these guys, the one-year deals or the veterans and stuff. I got it. You know, you want to maybe hope they do well. You could trade them at deadline if they have to. But and the, they're going with the youth movement to a sense, uh, you know, with Beatty, Vientos, right? Nate Lavender was lights out in spring training. And he got option to the minors, like, so quick. And he, I was, like, so confused. I think this guy, he could be a major bullpen arm. I, I, I see him being called up sooner, if not later. We know the bullpen's going to be changing constantly i was getting in a, a debate in the comments sections on youtube somebody was saying to me oh you can't say the mets are going to call up drew gilbert he's not in the 40-man roster the 40-man roster is going to change about 70 times this season there's, there's guys are going to be optioned non-stop a catcher's going to get injured nito's going to come back then he's going to dfa you know, back in the minors. this happens all the time folks so we'll see what happens with that uh staff there but I want to know your thoughts here on Edwin Diaz. He's looked great, right? 
Where, what are you thinking ballpark wise for saves? Do you think this is going to be because like we mentioned we're both we're kind of agreeing they're not going to maybe have the lead too much? I think he's going to have under 30 saves. I think he's going to be great. He's going to have under 30 saves though. And listen, if I wanted to bet on this and figure out a way to make my own odds, I'll go to the Cut app. It's a peer to peer social betting platform, it's legal over 40 states. It has customizable odds, tracking capabilities, and an entire social network with group chats, user profiles, and rewards, all payments, no need for Venmo. So use our promo code right now, Believe Mets. That's capital B L E A V, capital M, and then E T S in lowercase. And put your money where your mouth is. You could you get the 10% welcome bonus discount there. And you could bet on Edwin Diaz's save total for the year. CP, what are you thinking for Edwin Diaz saves wise this season? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Nick. It really is a function of is he going to have that lead to come in to the game and and get that save? Obviously, with that injury, you're going to have to work him back up to what he was in 2022. Uh, a lot of appearances, four out saves, five out saves. That's probably not going to be the case for the majority, especially the first half of the season. I probably think it's going to be under 30 as well. I'm in the ballpark of maybe high 20s. I'd say 28, 29 is my comfort zone. I would love to see him hit that 30 mark. Um, but there's just a ton of external factors that just make me a little bit scared to put my money where my, where my mouth is in terms of that overall saves uh, metric. So I think 28 would be good. And I don't think that the saves total actually is going to have any sort of blemish on his overall performance. He's going to be great. It's just, is he going to come into the game trying to sort of keep the team in the game while, while it's tied or we're down? Or is he going to have the actual lead? And that's the question mark, right? Yeah, I think he's probably going to get in the game a lot when it's tied and maybe when it's down just to preserve, to kind of maybe give him a chance in the bottom of the ninth. We saw a Buck Showalter. He wasn't afraid to have Diaz come in in the eighth if he's three, four, five hitters. We'll have to see how Mendoza plays it here, obviously, his first season. So we'll see if he's able to command the room, command the respect of the players and kind of, you know, do whatever you want. Because there's a difference, whether it's Diaz or anybody, when – Buck Showalter is telling you, we're going to do this tonight because, you know, I think it's going to give us the best chance to win versus, okay, here's a guy who was the bench coach for the worst Yankee team record-wise the last 30 years. He's coming as a first-time manager. He's a rookie. Maybe he's going to be great. We don't know. So it's going to take some time to earn that trust and build that camaraderie in the locker room. But I think the thing that I'm really worried about this season, CP, has got to be this starting rotation. Look at these numbers. They are ugly. They have a combined average ERA of 4.696 last season. To put that in perspective, last year the Mets starting pitching or, or overall staff a 4.30 ERA, which was 19th best in the league. So they didn't improve there. They actually made things worse. 4.696, that would make them the... 24th best team in the majors. And to put that in perspective, last year, the Los Angeles Angels had a 4.64 ERA. The Cardinals had a 4.79 ERA. So definitely, definitely, definitely worried about this starting rotation. Luis Severino coming off a career worst year. Jose Quintana coming off a career minimum year in innings pitch. Manaya coming off a year where he was so bad at the beginning that he had to go to the bullpen. Adrian Hauser coming off a career worst year ERA wise. Tyler McGill, a very up and down year. He right here led the team of this roster in his pitch last year. Severino hasn't started over 20 games since 2018. CP, I'm worried about the starting rotation. How are you feeling about these guys? I do have some worries about the overall ability to sort of produce um, high volume innings right across the board over a course of 162. I think that's my biggest worry. But when you look at that rotation, right, you just named what the ERA was in 2023. It wasn't pretty, right? Um, what can really go worse than what went bad last season, to be honest with you? I think Quintana might have a little bit of a leg up this season, finally starting off the season healthy. We know that he's the open day starter. Sean Manaya, we don't know what we're going to get from him. Uh, he's looked a little on and off in spring training, obviously post haircut, looking a lot better in terms of uh, the numbers. Like man. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I made the joke but, um, I really he's he's going to pitch better because now there's no hair in his way when he's coming to the plate. 
Exactly. He gets that full arm action. I like that. Um, but yeah, no, nonetheless, I, I think that when you look at the expectations that were set on the Mets rotation, obviously having two Hall of Famers and a newcomer in Kodai Senga as your top three versus what was actually produced. I actually just talked about that on my live stream. Kodai Senga was never slated to be an ace of a rotation last season coming you know, over from overseas. Um, and he was the ace. So everything flopped last season in the rotation. I can't buy into the fact that it's going to get too much worse this season. Now, Luis Severino, like you said, the innings pitched is definitely a very big concern with him. Hasn't done, you know, like you just said, hasn't what pitched 20 games since 20, 2018, yep. you just said. So that is the concern over one, 162, but I don't think that he's going to mimic at all what he did last season. You're talking about a 6.85 ERA career worst. I think that he's going to be more in line to a mid three ERA, maybe even just touching the surface of a four ERA. But the thing is that I looked at the fan graphs projections, Luis Severino, they're projecting him at 26 games started. If he even is able to pitch 20, 21 games, I'll take that in the bag for the New York Mets. Now, the biggest concern for me is not only the innings pitched, but what are we going to get out of Tyler McGill? Because we all know as soon as Kodai Senga comes back, this is going to be a six-man rotation. What are we getting from Adrian Hauser? I think Adrian Hauser last year was serviceable. Like you said, career-worst ERA, but he's been consistent in his Milwaukee Brewers days. Not too much worried about him, but what is the consistency factor that we're going to get out of Tyler McGill and Sean Manaya? Those are the two guys in this bullpen or in this rotation, excuse me, that I am the most worried about. But nonetheless, I really don't think it's going to get much worse than last year, so we can breathe just a little bit. Things could always get worse. <laughs> yeah, but for Severino, I'm very concerned, obviously. Manaya, I'm very concerned. I, I, I hate being told, oh, he had an excellent September. We saw that last year with Eduardo Escobar. He was then terrible in April. So I don't want to hear about, oh, this, he made three starts down the stretch. He was decent when his team was out of it. I know he's a lefty, so I'll begin all the chances. Hauser, the only plus here with this rotation is that four of these guys are on one-year deals. So maybe there's some motivation there to have a great outing, pitch well. Now, I and you, maybe we disagree. I personally think this team is not going to be great this year. I think they're likely going to be sellers at the deadline. So if, if, if you get one of these guys pitching well, at least you could maybe deal, deal him, get some bullpen help, get some young arms for something for the, the following year. I think this year, you know, they'll, they'll go out there, they'll try as things start off, but if they get to the trade deadline, and I, by the way, that London series is going to be huge versus the Phillies to determine how the Mets season is going. But when they get to the trade deadline, if they are around 500, I, I think they, they're they more likely to just stay put than they are to buy. I don't think they're going to be selling selling the young players. But if they're like, you know, three, four, five games out of it, I think, I think we could be looking at a fire sale. Again, David Stearns has no ties to these players as, uh, that sure. he, he developed. So I think at that point, you know, we could be looking at a fire sale. We could be looking at a Pete Alonzo trade. Uh, let's hope not. But a lot of that's going to come down to this starting lineup, this, this, this hitting. Is there enough offense here? I personally don't think there's enough offense. I mean, there's this, this whole thing was made up about, well, we got better defensively with Harrison Bader. And Nimmo, he's so selfless. He's going to move to left field. Well, Nimmo had no say in that. He's under contract. What was he going to say? No, I'm playing center field. Nimmo's going to play plenty of center field because Harrison Bader hasn't played 100 games in in very long time. So great, yeah, Harry Bader's Bader's great defensively, but he hasn't hit much in the regular season, and he also hasn't played much. So that's that's a concern for sure. Uh, what do you, what are you thinking here? What would your opening day lineup be, and what do you think the actual opening day lineup is going to be? Well, I mean, I don't know if you saw the Decomo tweet and saying what the lineup versus the Cardinals a couple of days ago in spring training yeah. might look eerily similar to the opening day lineup with McNeil there in the, in the cleanup spot. But nonetheless, I think there's going to be a lot of fumbling around to do. Whatever happens in opening day is not going to be what you see probably two or three weeks down the line. Carlos Mendoza, whoever makes these lineups, whether it's coming from the top or actually from Carlos Mendoza's mind, um, is going to be a lot of fumbling around to do. I think this lineup is going to be very top heavy. I think we're talking about issues and, and gaps in this lineup uh, toward the tail end. What is Harrison Bader going to get you offensively? Like you said, I think that was a little bit of an overpay for David Stearns one year, $10 million. I would have been fine with maybe like a five or $6 million deal, but I think an extra four on top of that's pretty generous for what he has lacked, which is 
availability over the last couple seasons. Um, you're talking about a DH platoon now, probably with the services of Mark Vientos, who really hasn't taken that step so far in spring training. And probably if there's a platoon, G-Man Choi, I would have to guess, at least opens up this season on the actual roster, grabbing that last bench spot. And then you're also talking about Starling Marte has not had a pretty season or spring training campaign nonetheless here very early on as well so um, a little bit more worried about Marte than I am and Marte Vientos and Bader than I am more so of Brett Beatty who's recently been turning it on I think Brett Beatty is going to be fine I think he's going to be a starting third baseman but you also have to think like he just is coming off of a 212 year defensively um, obviously struggled as well both sides of the ball said the lights were a little bit too bright more or less in one of his interviews that he did um, when he got sent down back to AAA last season so you got to think that the first five guys are what they are in any combination. I would like to see the Mets actually move Brandon Nimmo down. I know that he's a prototypical leadoff guy. I don't think he's going to be staying in that leadoff spot over the course of the next couple of seasons, especially with him being older. That on-base percentage is not going to change just because you move him down the lineup. And I think that his increased power, you see the trend that we're starting to see, and especially with the likes of maybe a Jet Williams, Drew Gilbert, or Luis Angel Acuna coming up, maybe those guys are more aligned to be a leadoff type role. Uh, you also have Francisco Lindor that can be a leadoff guy, has done it in Cleveland uh, over there uh, when, during his time over there. So there's going to be a lot of fumbling around to do. But my primary concern, just to wrap this up with the offense, is that... One through five, we know who we're going to have. Alonzo, Lindor, Nemo, probably McNeil if I had to guess, and Alvarez. What happens six through nine? Because those are the guys that are going to need to carry the load here in terms of making us either sellers at the deadline, like you said, right? Or getting Edwin Diaz, those 30-plus saves, versus maybe not so much. If you put a bet on Edwin Diaz, 30-plus, the bottom of the line is going to have a lot to say about that. So... Um, I, I don't know. I'm expecting a big, a big season from Brett Beatty. I don't know what we're going to get out of Mark Vientos. Like I said, but the projections are what they are. Maybe we see 230, 240 with 25 plus home runs. Maybe that's a little ambitious with how he's looked in spring training. I don't know. We just have to find run production and consistency out of the bottom of the lineup. That's my biggest concern. I think it's a problem when your DH is going to about eighth. <laughs> That's like, uh, you know, sure. you could still get Steve Martinez. They're not going to get him. They could add J.D. Davis on the cheap. But Stearns, you know, he's gung-ho. Mark Vientos, he's got the exit velocity. G-Man Choi, you know, I like him. He hasn't hit really much in spring training. DJ Stewart, he hasn't hit much. I would like to see Luke Voigt actually get a legit shot. You know, he's got the power. But, you know, the problem is that other than Pete Alonzo, they're not – really going to get, get much power out of this lineup. Uh, Lindor will hit, you know, 25 home runs, but Lindor last year, what, he hit 30 home runs, but a lot of that was back heavy, back in the second half. Like, that's when he inflated his numbers. So you kind of need – when the home runs come does matter. Even Vogelback ended up with, you know, respectful numbers. So Pete Alonzo, there's only so much he could do power-wise to carry the, the team in the early months. And you, you – you need Marte to bounce back. You need Bader to be healthy. You need Beatty to be good. There's too many ifs here, CP. <laughs> yeah, a lot of ifs, things have to go right. You're right. You're, a lot of things ifs, have to go right. You're not in rea dealing with reality. So, listen, I, I really hope that we're, you know, we're here in May. We're talking about the team's playing well, and Drew Gilbert's getting called up, and he's going to be our Corbin Carroll. He's going to carry the team. I mean, his, his arm looked so impressive. It looked like he could hit. Um, you know, I would have liked to see these young guys play a little more in spring training uh, yeah. because I, I I wanted to see what they got. Acuna, I'm not necessarily sold on him uh, being like the superstar. You know, Jet Williams, the same thing. They have all these guys right now, but what are the chances that all four or five of these top prospects are going to come up and hit? It's pretty low. So you're, you're looking at maybe one or two. So I'm not a person who wants to, you know, hold on to these prospects. If for some reason they are in the midst of it at the deadline or even next off season, like I get it. Everyone's saying Jet Williams is going to be this great center fielder, but there's no guarantee. We thought Brett Beatty was going to be the Mets, you know, next even right. So if you're able to trade him next year or whatever, just, just, just saying for like a Cy Young award winner, right? That's something you should entertain. Um, again, there's so many position players that the Mets acquired at the deadline last year. There's just not enough spots. Nimmo's going to be here. Lindor's going to be here. McNeil's here. So you're looking at second base slash two out slash two outfield positions and shortstop. So you have all these shortstops. 
you got to see. Is Acuna going to be good at second base? Is he going to be good in the outfield? Is Jet Williams going to be good in the outfield? Uh, the the guy they got from um, the Diamondbacks looked really impressive in the breakout game. The shortstop, uh, Rodriguez, was it right? Rodriguez. So, yeah. You got uh, Marco Vargas from the Marlins. He's another shortstop. So just a lot of shortstops. So eventually they got to make some position changes. They're very lacking on the uh, the pitching side of the prospects. But, you know, Christian Scott, he looked great in spring training. I think we'll maybe see him soon. Mike Vassell. Uh, the, the prospect that really excited is really exciting me from the limited time we got to see him is Ryan Clifford. He's got yeah. legit power. I think he's a guy who could hit 35, 40 home runs. Maybe he's that answer for the power, and he's a few years away. I understand that, but but he's 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 he he really excited me from seeing him in spring training. Which of the prospects excited excited you this spring training? I mean, Christian Scott. It's hard not to name him first. There's a little bit of recency bias here. Obviously, that just elite slider that he possesses now, fastball up to 97 miles per hour. Obviously, just just elite stuff. Seven strikeouts over four innings. He looks like he can be. At best, like his ceiling, like a top of the line starter. But obviously, if he slots into more of a mid rotation type spot, that's that's perfectly fine too. With the one year deals, like you said earlier, the Mets are going to have to find plug and play answers here for this rotation, whether it's Vasil, Christian Scott, or whoever else. You also have exciting other pitchers too, Blade Tidwell. Um, the stuff, just the sheer stuff, looked pretty pretty decent. Uh, Brandon Sproats in this organization. Um, you have obviously Dom Hamill who struggled today, obviously against the Tigers, but nonetheless. Uh, he did decently last year in double-A, Binghamton. Um, I think the guy that definitely excites me the most has to be Drew Gilbert, man. It has to be Drew Gilbert. Um, I think at the major league level, he could definitely be a five-tool player. Probably the weakest tool that he will possess is probably his power, his raw power. I think he's maybe a 14 or 15 home run type guy. He's not going to hit you consistently 20 plus bombs, but nonetheless, every other aspect of his game is electric. His speed, his arm, the gap to gap sort of power that he possesses in terms of doubles or legging out a double to a triple. He yep. is probably going to make the most immediate impact offensively of any sort of prospect. And I know a lot of people are high on Jet Williams. I am too, but if I had to pick the guy, the cream of the crop, that's going to impact this team first and the most, maybe even as early here in the first few months, like you said, of this season, is definitely Drew Gilbert. And I was so excited to get him back in that return in that Justin Verlander deal. Yeah. A lot of people were obviously pissed off that the Mets cleaned house last year um, at the trade deadline. I guess they sort of still had a shot, but the Mets front office decided to call it quits and they got some decent hauls back. But definitely Drew Gilbert, absolutely. But that shortstop competition over the next couple of years, David Stearns is going to have his work cut out for him in terms of navigating who's going to be in this organization versus who's not. Because like you said, this team, when they get a little bit more, I guess, not money, they always have money to spend, but a little bit more, I guess, a fire burning in their pockets to spend, maybe a little bit more fire and passion to sort of trade off some prospects and that plethora of depth that they have at the shortstop and middle infield positions in the minor leagues. Marco Vargas, Jeremy Rodriguez, Jeremiah Jackson, um, Luis Angel Acuna, like, these are going to be tough decisions that the Mets front office has to make. And um, I'm just not sure who has the edge there. You also have Colin Houck, recent draft pick of the New York Mets there as yeah. well. So a plethora of guys to choose from. I definitely do think Christian Scott and Drew Gilbert have to top that list. But let's not bat an eye towards the guys that we've also been seeing here. Um, Alex Ramirez is a guy who's often forgot about. I know he had an abysmal year in 2023, but I think he has a resurgent type season in the minors and really – starts opening up some eyes again because he was one of the Mets' top prospects, let's not forget, in that 2022 campaign um, before that haul this past season in 2023. So we'll see what happens. I think the Mets are going to be good, and I think that at least – the right baseball mind. I know a lot of people have their own opinions about David Stearns. A lot of people are putting this plan on David Stearns. Whether this plan to not spend as much and cut back a little bit to see what the Mets have in their organization was David Stearns' idea or not, I don't know. It's not for me to say, but I think that he is the right baseball mind in terms of evaluating talent and letting the right guys go versus keeping the right guys to build this organization and keeping that future intact. Well, the way things are right now, the I think they'll reset under the Cohen luxury tax for next off season. And it helps that just the Verlander is hurt because if he doesn't hit his X amount of innings, which he's not mm -hmm. going to, 
they're yeah. not going to have to pay him for next season. So him and Scherzer off the Bucks, which would be uh, $90 million to spare there. Obviously, you know, they're going to go for, they're going to try to get Juan Soto, but we mentioned the pitchers. So if Christian Scott comes up and he's great, awesome. Still got to sign three pitchers. So they should be shopping at the top with the Corbin Burns. Um, unfortunately, Wheeler, he resigned. So there's going to be a lot of this. I think this roster from opening day this year to opening day next year, we could look at like a 15 person turn, turnover. It's going to be crazy. 180, be, a complete 180. Yeah. It's going to be wild. But uh, who do you think is the first call up as far as like, so I, I'm going to paint the scenario for you here. It's April. Either Harrison Bader or Starling Marte get hurt, which is very likely. And yeah. they got to call somebody up. Now, are we going to, are they going to say, all right, well, uh, you know, we'll move McNeil to the outfield, we'll play Joey Wendell, or are they going to say, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll stick with Tyron Taylor out there. We'll, we'll call up uh, Luke Boyd, we'll, whatever. So are they going to do that? Or are they going to have the guts to say, we're going to call up Gilbert. We're going to call up Acuna. Cause maybe they say, we don't want to do that. Cause when Bader comes back, we want him to play. The last sure. thing I want to see them do is I, I pull another Mark Vientos, where they've done this for so many years. They call up a top prospect. He's on the bench. He'll pinch it twice a week. Maybe they'll get a start. And the conference got shot, and they can't hit. So how do you think that Jose is going to play? Who's going to be the first person they call up from the minors when, when injury strikes offensively? What was the uh, picture in terms of the actual month that it was? April. Okay. So – you know, with any team here, you have service time manipulation yep. intact here as well. So I truly do think that Tyrone Taylor is that next man up if one of those outfielders go down. Obviously, they're going to try to steer the ship there with Tyrone Taylor. Very versatile, can play all three outfield positions. We don't know what we're going to get consistently with his bat. Jeff McNeil probably is not going to be an option to move to the outfield um, very early on. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong there, but I do think it's Tyron Taylor. And I think as soon as that, whatever day that is, that the service time resets and you save that year. And, and listen, I hate to put this on any team. Like I, I'm not like a, that's frowned upon amongst all fan bases, right? We want to yeah. see the prospects. We want to see them early enough. And I understand that there's a method to the madness, I suppose. Right. Um, Peter Lanz was a classic example of we're not even talking about his free agency if the Mets handle a different way. Now, I'm not saying that I was not a proponent of Peter Alonso coming up uh, when he did, because I certainly was. But obviously, he changes the ball game now. And you have to think, like, I don't know, maybe David Stearns approaches it differently, but I would definitely think they'd want to save an extra yeah. year like well, every they, other team they does. They saved Ronnie Mauricio last year till September to manipulate that. So. Well, I'm not. We're not talking about September. Yeah. Well, exactly. I, I hear what you're I'll saying. Say, they're, they're, sure. I don't. They're going to be in any rush to call up the prospects uh, sure. early in the season. So, but to answer I'd your be question, I think if we're Gilbert. seeing any of these guys, maybe we'll see a pitcher. I'd be surprised if we're seeing a position player like a Gilbert or Acuna before, let's say June or July. Uh, I think we okay. see them later on in the season. Um, but even pitching wise, like. First call up is going to be Budo. Yes. Joey Lucchese is going to be there. So it's going to be a while before we're seeing Christian Scott and Blake Tidwell and all the guys. So let's not get too excited about the prospects, but that's all I can really get excited about in the second half if they're out of it. And at, at that point, they better call them up and see what they got. But I think if there's an injury early on in the season in the outfield, I think I could see McNeely going to the outfield. I think Joey Wendell's going to start playing second base. They'll call up Jose Iglesias. Iglesias, I think, I'd love to see him on the roster. There's just no spot for him. But they're not going to carry him when they have Wendell. He's going to the minors. He's going to have an opt-out after 30 days if he's not promoted to the majors. So sure. I think that's the route you'll see. Iglesias, I'd love to have him on the roster. There's just no space for him. Um, and I think you'll yeah, we'll see Taylor. Taylor's going to play a bunch in the outfield. But yeah. you can't avoid these injuries. Uh, it's going to happen. Sanga's injured, obviously. But some good news with him is maybe he's going to start pitching this week. Doesn't really mean too much to me. I, I think we're not going to see him till late May or or June, unfortunately. I think mid May, late May is a safe bet there, Sango. I think that, that's true. That's very true. Yeah. So he'll come up six man rotation. We'll say, but lots of question so, marks for this team. I think. So yeah, a lot of question marks. Let me paint a picture for you, Nick. I'm just curious too. On the opposite side of the spectrum, like if the Mets are somehow in a wild card spot, let's say second wild card spot, third wild card spot, yeah. and it's the trade deadline coming up by some miracle, right? Everyone has their own opinions about where this team's going to be at because this is such a 
a unique season for the New York Mets coming up. What would you do at the trade deadline if they're in, in one of those spots? Well, uh, what I would do or what David Stern is going to do, I, I think I think David Stern is going to stand pat. I, I don't think they're going to add any money. Um, maybe they will add a relief pitcher. Uh, that's, I think, the extent of it. I'm, a different regime, I get it, but like 2022, they could have went for it. At the trade yeah. deadline, they did not. And they were yeah. on pace for 100 minutes. I don't see them going for it at the deadline if they're just teetering. I think they have to be like 10 games over 500, overplaying. And then at that point, I think Steve Cohen would be like, all right, screw it. Like, we'll go over sure. the Cohen luxury tax. Go get, you know, this, go get someone to be a, a number two closer. We need to start a pitcher. But again, to, at that point, like, if you're at in the wild card at the trade deadline, you're really playing with house money because again, we looked we looked at the starting rotation before. That means everybody's performing well. That means Beatty's right. playing great. Viendos is playing great. Bader's healthy. Marte's back in 2022. So I, I think that they would they would stand pat. Me as a fan, I would say let's go for it. Let's try to get something done. But that's why what do you what do you think they would do? I think I think they would just stay pat. I think it's a fair assumption to stay pat as well because there is a fine line of like, hey, you're teetering on the wild card spot versus you're actually truly in it. Like I like, like we've been saying this whole podcast, right? And I and I'm not naive to that fact, even though I do fall in line of maybe more of a of a I guess positive outlook, right? I think the Mets are going to be in that contention, whether they're they get it in to the wild to playoffs via wild card or they're just kind of a game or two shy. Doesn't really matter. I think it'd be a hard sell to try to improve on a team that you know is not sniffing the World Series. Right. You know what I mean? But then you can make the case that the Diamondbacks did it and and and, and, and what have you and the Phillies a couple of years ago. I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I, I said the same thing last year in 2023. I was like, if this team isn't overperforming, like I can't see them going out and spending valuable resources, right? To at that point, an already depleted farm system before the actual trade deadline played out. But I think that's a fair assessment. I think staying pat would probably be your best course of action. Maybe they make a move or two to get like uh, a reliever that won't cost you too much. You know, I, who, who knows how the factors and negotiations play out, but that's a very fair assumption. I think they'd stay pat as well, maybe get an additional piece or two, but nothing too major, I would say. It all depends on how many games up they are. You know what I mean? So it, it really is a lot of question marks, and it's a wait-and-see scenario in the first half based off of what they're going to do at the trade deadline. Yeah, we'll say Better be a good first half because if not, I think Pete Alonzo is going to get traded. So we'll see how it goes. We can talk about that another time. CPS has been great. Please let everybody know where they can find you and your stuff. Yeah, CP's uh, Mets and Knicks at CPNY Sports on X, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, the YouTube's almost at 600 subscribers. Um, just approaching up a year next month on the uh, on the channel, so I definitely appreciate it. If you want more Mets live streams, pre-recorded episodes, and collaborations, I'm going to be running a, a co-hosting, actually, with my fellow Mets content creator, Talking Mets with Rob, the Amazing Mets pregame show going live more often than not, obviously schedule permitting. But yeah, at CPNY Sports on YouTube is where you can find me the most. All right, appreciate it. Everybody, make sure you are, of course, following Believe in the Mets on all social platforms and subscribe on YouTube at B L E I V I N T H E M E T S. You could, of course, go to the Cut app and use the promo code Believe Mets, B L E I V M E T S with a lowercase ETS on I am on X at Nick underscore Durst and I am on Instagram at Nick's Food and Stuff. This has been great, CP. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to do it again. And until next time, everybody, let's hope for the best and let's go Mets. Thank you.